Allora ringraziamo il, il professor Cavalli e adesso mi è stato detto chi di voi vuole e non l'ha fatto si può unire di una cuffia per la traduzione simultanea dall'inglese perché l'intervento che farà eh, eh, Matthew Roberts sarà in lingua. Eh, eh, quindi eh, intanto che qualcuno va a, a unirsi della cuffia volevo eh, sintetizzare il, su alcuni passi del, dell'intervento del professor Cavalli che a me hanno particolarmente colpito. Il primo è la, eh, il fatto che ci sia questa sproporzione fra i paesi del terzo mondo, cosiddetto una volta o in via di sviluppo, e i paesi nostri, ma soprattutto, ed era il discorso che è stato fatto, ed è stato sempre ripetuto da vari ricercatori epidemiologi che questa differenza fra paesi poveri e paesi ricchi c'è all'interno dei paesi ricchi fra zone povere e zone ricche quindi i determinanti sociali di salute esistono e non sono dei surrogati ci sono ormai degli studi che documentano come sia la condizione di povertà e la condizione di subordinazione sociale a, 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 nel sistema di produzione, nel sistema sociale della vita di tutti i giorni, a essere fattore di malattia, non il fatto che, eh beh, ma si sa, chi è povero non può studiare e lo studio farebbe bene se lo studiasse, e no, è l'essere povero, l'essere subordinato, il non avere nessuna autonomia e nessuna prospettiva nella propria esistenza che è causa di malattia. Ora, per questo si dice che i medici sono mh, alcune, orientati a sinistra, nel senso che questa era una battuta che faceva nel 1880 già Fierkov prima di diventare un grosso della patologia generale, un grosso esponente, e aveva questa posizione, se un medico, ma soprattutto se uno scienziato, se un ricercatore ha davvero interesse al core, no? all'oggetto del suo studio, della sua ricerca, non può che essere orientato a riconoscere come l'ingiustizia l'ingiustizia sociale sia una causa, causa di malattia. Questo anche attraverso, e allora il secondo aspetto, il problema dei farmaci, della ricerca farmaceutica e del monopolio sia sulla, sulla comunicazione scientifica, perché da qualcuno è stato detto che le pubblicazioni scientifiche sono il braccio armato delle case farmaceutiche. New England Journal Messi, Lancet, BMJ e altre riviste che qualcosa fanno per mantenersi al di fuori del flusso, purtroppo spesso arrivano a pubblicare degli articoli di quel tipo che è stato detto, farmaci che sono significativamente dal punto di vista statistico più efficaci di altri, ma che poi ad andare a guardare bene allungano la sopravvivenza di 12, di, di 2 mesi, di 12, 12 giorni, sì. quindi il problema è proprio quello di un sistema che nel suo complesso la comunicazione scientifica, la ricerca scientifica, la somministrazione della cura e dell'assistenza e l'organizzazione del servizio che si dice non è più sostenibile, dobbiamo dargli una ripassatina, sono tutte finalizzate a un interesse che è un interesse di classe e questo emerge da qualsiasi punto lo si, lo si voglia guardare. Ecco, l'esperienza di Matt Rogas è quella di far parte di un gruppo internazionale che eh, si batte sul problema in particolare, ma non è il suo solo interesse. Detto, si sta, laureante sarà sì, eh, psichiatra all'inizio e credo che fosse anche stato il percorso iniziale del professor Cavalli di fare sì, ma, sì, psichiatria e poi dopo di, di cambiare eh, in, interesse o comunque approfondire il proprio interesse e lui ci parlerà delle iniziative di questa eh, associazione che per le eh, 
parte per le medicine essenziali, eh? anche in Italia parliamo adesso di livelli essenziali di assistenza da rivedere, ecco, eh, ci si riduce a dire va bene, diamo a tutti dei livelli essenziali di assistenza, ma se fossero davvero gli ess quelli essenziali sarebbe una buona cosa qualche volta dietro a questa idea passa un'idea di riduzione del settore pubblico a vantaggio del settore privato. So I'm, my name is Matt Roberts and I'm one of the European coordinators for universities allied for essential medicines. Um, LUAIM, which is the shortened form of universities allied for essential medicines, is an international student organization that campaigns around the world in various different ways for access to medicines. So we act, act at various different levels. We campaign at the university level trying to change the way in which universities conduct research and license their research. We're active at national levels trying to influence policy processes that relate to access to medicines. And we've also been active in international forum like the EU, the UN and the WHO. What I want to talk about in the next couple of few minutes is a sort of the, the background to the access crisis. And I apologize if some of what I say has already been mentioned um, and to those who may already be familiar with it, if I'm telling you what, I already, what you already know. Then after that I want to just propose a few of the solutions that we at the UAM as well as our in the access community um, believe are important in addressing these problems. So first of all, what is the access crisis? Part of the access crisis is what we call the access gap. So this describes the fact that on the one hand, one third of all people in the developing world don't have affordable access to medicines that can save their lives. Now this is a really massive issue. It's been estimated that around 10 million people die every year just because they can't get access to medicines that already exist. So we have the treatments that can cure these illnesses, but the people who need them the most aren't getting access to them. To put these numbers into context, the kind of highest estimates of the number of people who die as a direct um, result of conflict every year are less than half a million. So the access crisis kills more people every year than every war on the planet combined. And in almost in the majority of cases, the reason why people can't get access to medicines is because the medicines are priced too high. Too highly either for themselves to afford or too highly for their national governments to afford. And in most cases, the reason why these drugs are priced so highly is because a single pharmaceutical company will have the patent monopoly of that drug and it can set whatever price it likes. And the price that it will set will be the one that maximizes profit, not the one that maximizes health. So that alone would be a massive crisis, it would be an outrage, but it isn't the only problem. Because this only refers to illnesses for which we already have effective treatments. There are many illnesses for which we don't really have any effective treatments, and these are neglected diseases. One in six people in the world suffer from a neglected disease. And the people who suffer from these illnesses are generally the poorest of the world, people living in lower and middle income settings. And that really is the crux of why they are neglected. Because the people who suffer from these illnesses are too poor to provide a market for new medicines, there is no profit incentive for doing research into these illnesses. So very little research takes place and very few uh, drugs are produced. To give you an idea of kind of the scale of this problem, across the 29 year period in which almost 1,600 drugs were created, only 21 drugs were made for these illnesses. In fact, this is probably an overestimate because it includes TB and malaria, which aren't strictly speaking infected diseases. If we remove those diseases, only 10 drugs were made. That's 0.64% of all of the drugs that were made in that period. If you compare that to the one-sixth of the world's population who suffer from these illnesses, you can see the really massive disparity between the burden of illness and the amount of research focus that they receive. So these two problems, the research gap and the access gap, are really at the core of the access crisis. And as you can probably already see, they both stem from the same problem. That is, that our current research and development system is orientated towards maximizing profit, not towards maximizing health. It's also important to know, however, that this is no longer a problem that is confined to lower and middle income countries. This access crisis is expanding, and higher income countries in Europe and in North America 
are now also facing the strain. So there have been several examples that kind of illustrate this, and I just want to go through a few of them now. So the most famous of these is Sofosbuvir, which you've already heard a bit about today. Sofosbuvir is a very effective hepatitis C medicine. However, in the United States, a single 12-week course of Sofosbuvir for a single patient costs $84,000. In the UK, it costs the equivalent of $53,000. The company that manufactures Sofosbuvir, Gilead, has in just three and a half years made over $34 billion on the sale of hepatitis C medicines in the US alone. More recently, we've had the case of Orkambi. Orkambi is a cystic fibrosis medicine. Belgium and the Netherlands recently had to decide to not offer Orkambi in their national health system because the price that was demanded by the manufacturers was simply too high for those countries to afford. Now, this example becomes more outrageous when you realize that uh, Orkambi was almost, the research into Orkambi was almost entirely financed through charitable money. And almost all of the clinical trials for Orkambi took place in a publicly funded university hospital. And yet the company that manufactures Orkambi, Vertex, charges around $259,000 per year per patient for this drug in the US. In the UK, we've had the case of Abraham and Zantipa. These are both cancer drugs, and again, they were both developed with publicly funded research money. However, they've been priced so highly that the UK national health system has either had to not offer these drugs in the NHS or very strictly limit the number of patients you can have access to. And then finally, most recently, we had the case of Lucentis. So Lucentis is a treatment for wet macular degeneration. That's the most common cause of blindness in the world. The same manufacturers of Lucentis also manufacture a drug called Avastin. It's a nearly identical drug, but that drug is licensed for the treatment of cancer. Now, Avastin has been demonstrated to be safe and effective in treating macular degeneration, and it also costs 10 times less than Lucentis. However, the company that manufactures both of these drugs has refused to license Lucentis for the use in Mac has refused to license Avastin, sorry, for the treatment of macular degeneration, so that it continues to charge high prices for Lucentis. And when the NHS proposed to use Avastin off license at a much cheaper price than Lucentis, the drug company threatened the NHS with a very significant lawsuit, and that is still an issue that is kind of up in the air. So these kind of examples really illustrate the fact that this access crisis is now something that affects every country in the world. It is an increasingly serious problem. But it's also worth pointing out that the r system, as we currently have it, is not just failing to deliver affordable medicines, it's also failing to really deliver new medicines. So most of the new medicines that we have, the so-called new medicines that we have, are in fact what we tend to call Me Too drugs. They're minor modifications in the structural delivery of an existing me uh, medicine. So for example, you take a medicine that already exists, you change the way that it's delivered to a patient, so you maybe change the inhaler or the injection device, or you add a methyl group onto the structure. It's essentially the same medicine, but you can get a new patent on that drug and continue charging exceedingly high prices for it. We've already seen some examples of that um, from various different presentations, but from 1989 to 2000, 65% of new drugs that were approved by the US FDA uh, contained active ingredients that were already available on the market. So they were essentially not new medicines at all. More recently, the organization Prescribe has analyzed new medicines that were approved by the European Medicines Agency in 2016. And you probably can't quite make out the, uh, the numbers here, but this, 5% here is uh, medicines that the prescriber have sort of withheld judgment on. But this 17% and 16, 61%, most of the, of the chart, those are medicines are, which are not an improvement at all on medicines which already exist. So these so-called new medicines, the bulk of them, are all new two drugs. They are not new at all. This 10% here are possibly helpful. And only this 6% of new medicines actually offer any real definite improvement over the medicines that we already have. And it's important to note that these new medicines, because they will have, they will be patented from the start of the patenting process, will be more expensive than the medicines that we already have on the market. So not only is the R&D system failing to deliver affordable medicines, it is failing to deliver new medicines as well. At this point, it's probably good to get some context. So there are a few points to mention here. The first is that medicines are actually exceedingly cheap to manufacture. To physically produce a physical drug, the cost of that is minuscule. And the cost of manufacturing medicine is completely unrelated from the, to the price at which they are sold. 
The flip side of that, the other side of the coin, is that the pharmaceutical industry has consistently refused to release data on how much it costs to research and develop a drug. In the face of, of significant demands for them to do so, they have consistently refused to actually release that data. And I'm going to come back to that point a bit later on because it's very important. It's also worth reminding ourselves, as we already have done today, that the pharmaceutical industry is the most profitable industry in the world, with the possible exception of the military industry. The pharmaceutical industry has 19% profit margins. Those are, are huge profit margins. The pharmaceutical industry is also the industry that spends the most on lobbying of any industry. So we hear a lot about the gun lobby in America, but their spending is absolutely dwarfed by the spending of the pharmaceutical sector. Nine out of ten of the largest pharmaceutical companies spend more on marketing and lobbying than they do on R&D. So, that's quite a few problems that I've highlighted, and I want to now uh, focus a bit more on what we think can be done in the short term and the long term to help address some of these issues. But just before I go on, I think it's, it's always worth just reiterating the fact that all of these problems all stem from the same problem, and that is the R&D system as it currently stands is not fit for purpose. It is not orientated towards the patient interests, it is orientated towards the interests of companies. And that is the real problem that we're grappling with. So, what do we at UA and what do our, our many allies in the access medicines field believe can be done for these solutions? Well, one of the areas in which there can be improvement is the inclusion of global access provisions within research and development. So particularly when research and development is funded through public money, we believe a condition of receiving public money should be the inclusion of provisions and conditions which guarantee access to medicines. Now, we believe that these conditions should actually be included in all R&D and all research and development. But a, a quick, well, hopefully a quick and easy first step would be to make them a condition of receiving public money. So the most, basic, uh, the most basic level of this, I suppose, are comprehensive access strategies. So we believe that publicly funded research and development should include formal strategies for ensuring access to medical products. These strategies should consider all of the potential barriers to access and include comprehensive strategies for how these barriers are going to be overcome. So essentially, if you are working on developing a new medicine, you should have, and as a condition of receiving public money, you should have included strategies into how you are going to make sure that this medicine will be accessible to as many people as possible. We also push for responsible patenting. So wherever possible, we believe that the end product of pharmaceutical R&D should not be patented. It should be available as a public good. However, where patenting is necessary, either to guarantee access, guarantee that the uh, medicine, sorry, reaches the market or to prevent patenting by hostile third parties, we believe that these intellectual property rights should be proactively managed in order to maintain access. So in other words, the purpose of intellectual property should always be to maximize access and never to maximize profit at the expense of access. And again, these sorts of conditions should be, con should be conditions of receiving public money. It's also worth pointing out at this point that generic production of medicines is one of the most effective strategies that we have. Um, that we currently have for um, reducing the price of medicine. So generic production, for those who might not be familiar with the term, is when multiple different companies all sort of produce copies of the same drug. And that's been demonstrated time and time again to push the price of that medicine down. So one example of this is Stavidine. So Stavidine was an HIV and AIDS drug. It's not used much anymore, uh, but at the time it was quite revolutionary. And generic production of Stavidine reduced the price of that drug by 30 times. So it massively increased that affordability, and it massively increased the number of people who had access to that at the time, like saving medicine. The other side of global access is open access policies. So we believe that all R&D should include policies that third parties should have the right to access publicly funded research, and the right to use the discoveries of publicly funded research. And central to this is the idea that the principles of open science and data sharing are essential to any effective R&D system. So we're not just trying to address the affordability of medicines here, we're also trying to address the fact um, that I mentioned earlier that our current R&D system is not really that innovative. And open science and data sharing between different research teams are crucial to improving on that system. The next area is transparency. So there are various different elements of transparency that we need to push for improvement on. The first of these is transparency of drug prices. So what's often quite surprising is that we simply don't know how much different countries are paying for their medicines. In fact, different countries don't know how much other countries are paying for their medicines. And this isn't an accident, this is an intentional strategy. 
because it allows pharmaceutical companies to charge more for their medicines. So for example, if the United Kingdom doesn't know how much the Netherlands are paying for their medicine, then they will have, well, if they do know how much um, the Netherlands are paying for their medicine, they will have a stronger negotiating position and might be able to get a cheaper price for their medicine. So the pharmaceutical industry makes sure that these prices are kept fairly and transparent. So on the one hand, the publication of these prices, publicly, making them publicly available, would facilitate advocacy. It would improve accountability, and it would allow us as advocates in the, in the access to medicines arena to highlight to the citizens of different countries how much their governments are actually paying for these medicines, how much these medicines are really costing their country. There's also potentially a role for joint price negotiations. So joint price negotiations are where different countries form a single sort of negotiating block, a single entity with which they then negotiate for a particular drug with different drug companies. So one example of this is the Benelux collaboration. This is the collaboration between Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Austria. And they negotiate again as a single entity with drug companies for individual drugs. And there may well be a role for these drug price negotiations in improving the price that countries can get medicines for, which will obviously improve access and will improve the uh, situation for their health systems. The other area of transparency is the transparency around the price of research and development. So as I kind of touched on earlier, there is essentially no transparency on what the average cost of researching and developing a medicine actually is. Pharma have not released these figures. What they have released are pharma-sponsored studies that provide estimates of how much they argue it produces it costs to, to research and develop a drug. However, quite apart from being pharma-sponsored, these studies have been criticised or vastly overestimating the likely price of R&D. They, they all rely on quite a lengthy string of very dodgy and dubious assumptions, as well as some seemingly quite arbitrary increases in the estimate. And independent studies, for example, by the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, which is a, a really great non-profit uh, biomedical research development body, have come up with estimates that are around 10 times lower than the official pharma estimates. So a, a common figure that's thrown around by the pharma industry and, and unfortunately has been taken up fairly uncritically by most of the media is that it costs around a billion to two billion dollars to research and develop a medicine on average. Uh, but independent estimates, for example by the NDI, based on their own experience, have found that it probably costs more like 100 to 150 million dollars to produce medicine. Some estimates have been even lower, around 50 million. So 10 times lower than the official estimate. However, again, the problem here is that all of these are essentially estimates because we simply don't know how much it costs to research and develop medicine. And this lack of transparency in the dubious estimates that are put out by the pharmaceutical industry are intentional because they allow the industry to legitimise the excessive prices that we pay. So we need to push for more transparency on how much it costs to research and develop the drug. And we need transparency on the price of R&D to be, again, a condition of receiving public money. Another aspect of transparency is transparency around the funding of R&D. So surprisingly, there's very little transparency on who is actually funding particular research and development studies for new medicines. We know that overall, a large proportion of overall research is funded by public money as well as by charitable money. But we don't know which individual studies are, and we frequently don't know how much of a given individual study received public money. And this is quite important for advocacy, because the, the critical argument that we make is that publicly funded research must produce public goods. However, this is a much more difficult argument to make if we don't know which studies were actually financed by public money. We just know that a lot of them are. So we need more transparency in this topic so that we can push more effectively um, for access to medicines. And then finally, in transparency is transparency around clinical trials. So this is a topic that received quite a lot of attention. There's been um, various sort of higher profile people who have advocated for this. Ben Goldie, who is quite a well-known example of someone who is quite active in this field. The crux of this issue is that new medicine is the trials of new medicines that find no improvement over the existing and generally cheaper medicines on the market are significantly less likely to be published. So if I do a, a research trial into a new medicine and I find that that new medicine is more effective than the existing medicines, it's pretty likely that that study is going to be published. However, if my trial finds that there is no improvement over existing medicines or even that it's actually, this new medicine is worse than what we already have, it's significantly more likely that that study will just not be published at all, so it won't be visible. And this is a really massive issue, because it means that the data that we have that says that new medicines are better than the original, the existing medicines, 
may simply be not valid, it may not be reliable. And so nations may well be paying more for newer, more expensive medicines that are not necessarily more effective based on misleading data. And you can see the effect that would have on access to medicines and on the healthcare systems as a whole in different countries. All of these solutions, although very important, are all essentially treating the symptom rather than the cause. And the cause, as I like to keep saying, is the fact that the R&D system as it currently stands is not fit for purpose. So what we need to be thinking about in the long term, in the broader sense, is pushing for an alternative R&D system. One that is not focused around profit, but one that is focused around patients. Now this is um, a very big topic, and I'm not going to go into too much depth over it because it would probably take um, a much longer presentation. There have been various different um, conversations that have been going on around these topics. So people have been pushing for the establishment of progressive global principles for research and development, the establishment of a global pools fund for R&D, and the establishment of alternative funding mechanisms for R&D that delink the price of medicines from the cost of research and development. And that last idea, delinkage, is a really important idea, and it's one that's been gaining quite a bit of traction recently. Quite excitingly, the, the recent United Nations High Level Panel on Access to Medicines, or the UNHLP on Access to Medicines, acknowledged really for the first time that delinkage was an important topic that needed to be considered in how we are going to address the flaws that exist within the current system. Now that paper, that report, uh, proposed delinkage as an addition to the current system. We would view it more as an alternative. But the fact that it is being discussed at this level is quite an encouraging sign. The actual mechanism for delinkage, um, I can have, I'll have to talk about the questions and I'm not going to go into too much depth on now just because I'm probably running out of time. But if you are interested, interested in the sort of alternative uh, biomedical funding mechanisms and this idea of an alternative system for conducting research development, I would, uh, I'm slightly biased, but I would encourage you to go and look at UAM's new report. This was a report that mapped out all of the kind of different existing and proposed uh, systems by which we could develop an alternative R&D system, and it's quite um, a good way to, to get a primer on that issue. Now I'll just finish by uh, plugging again the fact that UAM will shortly be releasing our Global Charter for the Advancement of Equitable Biomedical Research and Development, or the R&D Charter for short. This is a document that essentially sets out our vision for what, and the vision of many of our allies in the access community, for what an equitable and effective R&D system should look like and what we should be striving to achieve. And we'll be asking different uh, publicly funded research bodies to sign on to this charter. So I'll finish there. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can either ask me now or ask my email.